monastic life is a mystery to many. It is a life set apart with great purpose, with commitment, primarily a life of prayer and praise of God and prayerful intercession for the church and the world. It is a countercultural response to the world. Our lives in the monastery are an offering of fruitful sacrifice and penance to be transformed into Christ in unity with our brothers and community. It is a life of ceaseless prayer, praise of God, thanksgiving for all that God has done, and of course, that intercession that we know is so needed today. Nestled along the Cooper River near Charleston, South Carolina, Mebkin Abbey is an idyllic southern refuge. Massive oak trees draped in Spanish moss that flow like feathers on every breeze. Colorful azaleas bursting with vibrant seasonal pastels and the peaceful sounds of nature murmuring all around. In a world that moves faster than most can process, monastic life can seem like a remnant of a bygone era. A life choice that struggles for footing as the hustle and bustle of the 21st century shows no signs of stopping. Becoming a monk is rarely the result of some major transition in your life or some kind of escape from reality. It is a genuine longing for something different. It's a very personal call from God to come apart and live for God alone. It is how God has been forming your soul, calling you to Himself. Now you understand there's no other way to respond but to become a monk. If this call is not there, it won't work. I'm Brother Ambrose and I'm from Guyana. I was raised a Protestant from a God-fearing family, so I was brought up a Christian my entire life. But I was not aware of the contemplative aspect until I was introduced to a book written by Henry Nouwen. And it was really refreshing to me how simple it was and how I could relate to almost everything that he was writing about. And I felt like at that time of my life, that's what I needed, a space that I can be free to commune with God, to recognize where my journey has got me and what are his plans for me. The word monk is derived from the ancient Greek word monos, meaning alone. Christian monasticism began in the second century when St. Anthony the Great and the Desert Fathers lived alone as hermits in the Egyptian desert. The first Trappist monastery in the United States was Our Lady of Gethsemane, established in 1848 near Bardstown, Kentucky. Like many monasteries, Gethsemane follows the rule of St. Benedict, a 73-chapter guide on how to seek Christ while living in a group under an abbot's authority. The Benedictine rule was built upon the simple edict of pray and work. Those living by this rule devote eight hours a day to prayer, eight hours for sleep, and eight hours for manual work, sacred study, or works of charity. The monks of Gethsemane and later Mebkin embrace a stricter application of the rule of St. Benedict and are known as Trappists. I'm Oscar, and I was born in the Philippines. I grew up with my grandparents, and it was my grandma who was a very devoted Catholic. I was reading books about monks, you know, the saints of the church who were monks and who were nuns, you know, those who were really into the contemplative life. And so that sort of served like a seed that was planted in my heart, you know, the desire to live a hidden, a simple and a quiet life. I went into philosophy and theology, and yet I was still dissatisfied, you know, because I knew that the life that I was, I was entering and living at that time was not really part of that initial desire, part of that initial dream. Mebkin Abbey was founded in 1949 when the Diocese of Charleston received the donation of land by Henry and Claire Booth Luce. Henry Luce was a wealthy magazine publisher, including Time Magazine, Life, and Sports Illustrated, who purchased the land in 1936 with the intention of making it their family's winter home. 
Luttrell Briggs, a well-known landscape architect and designer of many of Charleston's finest gardens, was called upon to cultivate the beauty of the lush southern grounds, with many aesthetics that remain to this day. In November of 1949, 29 monks from Gethsemane were sent to Mepkin to begin this new foundation. Since that time, more than 220 men have entered Mepkin, with 14% persevering to the end. I'm Kyle Berceau and I'm from Wilmette, Illinois, which is a suburb just north of Chicago. About seven years ago, I really had experienced that my spiritual life took off in a deeper way and just this desire for an unceasing life of prayer. So I kind of like started to explore for the first time, like, you know, maybe there's something to these monasteries out there and never thought about it prior to that. This life just feels like the way I, I was made and wired. I feel like I'm just meant to, to read, to write, to pray, and to simply gaze on the Lord in my heart and in others. First and foremost at Mefkin is prayer. The monks rise early for 4 a.m. vigil. The term vigil comes from the Latin vigilia and refers to purposeful sleeplessness. It is a time of solemn worship, of prayer and contemplation as our brothers prayerfully intercede for the needs of the world during that fourth watch of the night. Vigil is so very representative of the life and purpose of monastic life. A vegetarian breakfast in silence is available beginning at 5 a.m. This usually consists of fruit, bread, and hot cereal. At 7 a.m. concludes the grand silence that began the day before at 7.30 p.m. Many people believe that monks take a vow of silence. We don't, but we commit to a very silent life to foster solitude so that deeper prayer and mindfulness of God can happen throughout the day. Silence fosters mindfulness of God. It opens our mind and heart to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, helping us avoid the distractions and words and noise. Embracing silence or reservation of speech allows us to submit ourselves and our words to God. The prayers continue at 7 a.m. with Mass and Lauds. Lauds is considered morning praise, representative of daybreak prayers to begin the new day. The monks continue with the Eucharist or Holy Mass in which bread and wine are consecrated for a sacred communion. Mass is then followed by terse, mid-morning prayers to represent the third hour after dawn. After terse, the monks assemble in the chapter room, where daily work is assigned. Work is an essential component of the monastic life. Physical labor provides balance of mind and body and spirit, which is essential to this life of prayer and community, as well as to provide a way to make a living, as our rule requires by working in one of the many industries of our monastery. Labor takes on many forms at Mepkin, much of which involves efforts to support and sustain the community, such as general maintenance, property upkeep, a community garden, and food preparation. When I came here, I was given the task uh, of helping a brother monk to work in the greenhouse and the farm. To work with a brother in the garden means to really get my hands dirty, you know, <laughs> to get my hands into the soil, you know, and I, I was brought back to my childhood when I helped my grandma in the garden. And I would remember my grandma telling me, each seed has that potential. That there, inside the seed, there's that future uh, tree, future rose. But not all the time would 
something that what we expect from the seed would come out you know in our time in our in our expectation but there's a lot of waiting to be done a lot of patience a lot of uh, hopeful expectation but it all happens at God's appointed time MEV can also sustains itself through products and services for sale to the public and guests of the monastery. Since 2008, Mebkin has grown mushrooms for Charleston's thriving culinary scene. Two greenhouses grow ornamental plants year-round for an annual public sale. A select portion of Mepkin's 3,200 acres is cultivated annually for timber and replanted in accordance with our conservation easement. The gift shop greets visitors with a number of keepsakes and samplings of Mepkin's offerings. The columbarium is a wall of remembrance for those who choose Mepkin's serene aesthetics as the final resting place for themselves or loved ones. And finally, the retreat center provides on-site opportunities to experience monastic life for individuals and group retreats, overnight visits, and extended stays. After the morning work period, the community gathers for midday prayer, followed by dinner. Dinner is the heartiest meal of the day. Chef Enzo takes great delight in providing wholesome vegetarian meals that utilize homegrown ingredients from the community garden. After dinner, the rest of the day consists of work, studies, and classes until gathering for an evening supper. Like breakfast, supper is simple and consists primarily of bread and cheeses. Six o'clock vespers, or evening prayer, begins our move into the close of the day. Life is a pilgrimage. As we grow in our Christian walk, we come to understand that our call is often a process that unfolds over time. Unlike choosing a career where you may ask yourself, what do I want to do? As Christians, we ask ourselves, what is God inviting me to do with my life? Who is God inviting me to become? I came to Mepkin as a 64-year-old Jesuit who had been a Jesuit for uh, 46 years and a priest for 34 years. I was a teacher, I was a principal, I was a chaplain in hospitals and in prison, and I loved each and every one of my assignments. But over the last few years, I just wanted to pray, <laughs> even more than work. The Lord was inviting me to move from the active life and into a contemplative life. My friends and colleagues in uh, college were getting married, getting career paths and things. And uh, I had gone to an interview for a uh, graphic design gig. Towards the end of the interview, I realized this is not for me. And I didn't know what that still small voice was, but uh, I knew that God was calling me to something different. Intercessory prayer is at the heart of monastic life. Monks embrace this calling and seek to live it out daily through constant prayer. Y cuando vine a vivir este esta experiencia en en monastic guest program, me sentí muy identificado en la manera de de orar. Fue donde donde más me sentí llamado por Dios y sentí que llené ese vacío en mi interior que tenía por muchos años. In addition to praying through the Psalter. The prayer book of Psalms, as part of daily prayer rituals, Mebkin receives prayer requests from the public through letters and emails that are prayed in petition before God by the monks. The disciples learned about prayer directly from Jesus, who often withdrew to places of solitude to do so. Paul wrote in his letters of praying constantly for the young first century churches. This prayer of intercession has the power to transform our own lives as well as the lives of those for whom we pray. 
Working hand in hand with prayer is solitude, and Mebkin Abbey is like few others when it comes to places of contemplation. Throughout the grounds are seating, paths, art, gardens, and scenic vistas surrounded by spectacular oak trees at every turn. An all-encompassing environment, perfectly suited for one to step back from the distractions of the modern world for times of prayer and meditation. When I first came here, I was like, this feels like, you know, paradise. This feels like the Garden of Eden. I mean, especially now in this time of year in spring, like, it's such a grace to walk beyond the cloister, you know, into the larger grounds. In the contemplative life, I really value that sense of space and how it connects with silence and rhythm and all this stuff. And I just think it's, it's cool to see how the land and the beauty of the land connects in a deeper way with our life of prayer at the same time. As culture has changed, so has the monastery. Organized religion in America has declined since the mid-1960s, and Mebkin Abbey has not been immune from the impacts of that trend. Younger generations today are less inclined to make lifelong commitments. It's nothing unique to monasticism, but we face the challenge just the same. In a world where smartphones, tablets, and the internet dominate culture, choosing a life of quiet and solitude is a concept that is foreign to most people's experiences. We find that general awareness of monasteries is less now than it used to be. Even among those who might wonder if they're called to this life, it's often not something they're fully considering because they don't know much about monastic life or they simply don't understand it. On one hand, today's culture may be a difficult hurdle to overcome. On the other hand, today's culture is too fast, too hectic, too out of control for many people. There are those who would welcome a calling to step aside from that life and live a prayerful life for others, interceding for our society and for the whole world. As the number of monks began to decline across the U.S. and the average age of Mebkin's brothers reached the upper 70s, community dialogue and evaluation brought accommodations in the practice of living the life. Others who were not Catholic could come and taste monastic living in the monastic guest program. I thought, sure enough, I couldn't become a monk because I'm a, a Protestant. What I find out is that being a non-Catholic wouldn't be necessarily a requirement that could stop you from a monastic vocation. When I attended the Mass the following day, the morning, lay people who were allowed to sit on the choir loft beside the monks. I read in their history that they were trying to live out the message of the Second Vatican Council, the call for renewal and the call for even religious institutes and congregations to share their spirituality, to deepen the religious beliefs, the faith of God's people. Being in an area that's 4% Roman Catholic, there's an openness both in who we are and what we do. Monastic living is not just for those from a Catholic background. We welcome visitors and guests to participate in our prayer, not just as observers, men and women, bringing the gospel to life in the way we engage with those whom God is bringing to us. Becoming a monk is more than just professing vows and taking your place in the community. Any monastery is a brotherhood, a brotherhood with purpose and limitations to the life one has experienced on the outside world. While monastic life is a calling rather than a lifestyle choice, there are still many considerations that must be taken into account before making the commitment. And those considerations are a two-way street. Is Mebkin a good fit for the applicant? And is the applicant a good fit for Mebkin? The beginning of the process is simple enough. It begins with a conversation and an initial visit to see how we live. If the tug to come is still there, we welcome this person to live in the monastery for a month or more as a full participant in everything we do. Mepkin had this monastic guest program that invites people to live the contemplative life for a time within the community with the monks. While here on that monastic guest program, I realized clearly that starting on this contemplative journey over the years and where it had led me, and how this is the place that all that everything had 
intended for. It is an opening of the community for people to come, for people to experience their way of life, for people to somehow have a foretaste of what it is to be in the embrace of God's love in this particular community. After observation and prayerful consideration, a person may become an applicant and request to enter the community. This process involves a lengthy application, sacramental records, academic and medical records, letters of recommendation, and a psychological assessment. If accepted, he will enter the community for one year as a postulant and will wear a white hooded shirt. The first year is when the postulant becomes a member of the community in formation. At the end of that year, he may request to advance to become a novice. At this point, he receives his white robe, a white scapular and a white cloth belt, and a white cloak. He may change his name from his given name to a favorite saint or someone in the church history that he admires. The next two years are educational. The novice attends weekly classes on the rule of St. Benedict, Mebkin Constitution and Statutes, Scripture, Prayer, Sacramental Life, and Monastic Spirituality, as well as counseling, lectures, and regular meetings with the superior, all intended to prepare the novice to profess temporary vows. In the Cistercian Order, it's traditionally seen as a school of love. And so we are learning to love here, like learning to love God, first of all, to do through our prayers and you know, meditation, contemplation, and then to love others, you know, to love the brothers here in the community, and then to love people outside in the world you know, through our, our prayers and our, our witness of our lives. If the community approves, the novice will be invited to profess our three vows for one year. These are vows of obedience, stability, and conversatio morum, which is ongoing conversion or fidelity to the monastic life. At this time, the novice receives a black scapular and a leather belt. After living in temporary vows for three to nine years, he will prayerfully consider if he is to express a lifetime commitment in solemn vows. He receives his cowl, the final adornment of his monastic attire. The monastic life is a significant adjustment, even to those who are called. Some people may wonder if that means leaving your family behind. It doesn't. In fact, in some ways, the love and bond with one's family strengthens as the commitment to prayer, contemplation, and intercession becomes front and center in a monk's life. I asked my mom and my dad, I remember that time, if I could, after college, you know, enter a monastery. And I remember my dad telling me, um, you're still young, you may want to explore the world, you might want to explore uh, whatever it is that, that life has to offer. I became a deacon, I was ordained priest. And yet, it wasn't enough, you know. There was still something missing, something that's tugging in my heart to some, some place, you know, uh, other than where I was that time. Coming to the monastery is definitely something that's challenging for like anyone to understand. My parents have sacrificed so much for me and to, you know, there, there's this looming kind of fear of what's this, what's this vow of stability and I'm never gonna see you again. And, and so for them to kind of give me the grace to follow my heart in my life and to come here, um, it's really meaningful to me. And God's gonna bless that and he's gonna be with my relationships too, with those that are most important to me. And, and the Holy Spirit will work in creative ways to kind of deepen those relationships. So what is the future of Mevkin Abbey in a world that has changed so dramatically since its inception? Is there still a place for monasteries in a world that moves at breakneck speed? Is the monastic life no longer a realistic calling? The need for monastic life is greater than ever. While the world may seem to be turning from God, the need for His love, His presence, His life among us and his providence only grows more pressing by the minute. The world needs monks to continue to be that witness to kingdom values, to gospel values, and to intercede on the world's behalf. And that's what we are all about. Making people aware that Mepkin or other monasteries exist and that we provide a place where those whom God is calling can answer that call is the real challenge. Our purpose, our place in this world is very necessary. I 
don't think God is done with us yet. So far, it's been six months and just everything seems to be kind of in accord with that heart um, of mine and, and really just something that was placed there kind of from the beginning. And at this time in my life, everything's coming together where I'm coming into my full personhood and it's all being integrated now in this time. And so I'm just really grateful. It's kind of a beautiful time to be here in this special community. It takes a lot of waiting and patience and hopeful expectation and to be sensitive to the signs that point out that yes, this might be the life that God wants for me, not I want for myself. I didn't choose to come here, but I'm here because God brought me. Ultimately, I realized that everything that I've experienced, all the knowledge that I was building up over that process, and all the things that I've learned and the way I've grown interiorly, they were all things that I recognized that God was preparing me for this process, for being here at Metkin. As you have heard our brothers testify, the calling is so tangible, so profound, that it's almost impossible to ignore. It is a void that can only be filled by answering the call. As long as God is still calling people to serve Him in this way, the monastic life will have a place in the world. And Mepkin Abbey, what a beautiful, sacred place to answer that call. <laughs>